Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Newman, President and Director of the National Humanities Center, coming to you from the National Humanities Center in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, on a gorgeous spring day. And I want to take this opportunity to welcome you all to the In Our Image Artificial Intelligence and the Humanities Conference. We started our series of virtual conference events last Wednesday evening with a tremendous webinar on new frontiers of learning with AI in the classroom, led by Michelle Zimmerman, the executive director of Retin Prep in Retin, Washington, and followed that yesterday afternoon with a wonderful panel about the role of artificial intelligence in creating art with artists Ahmed Agamala and Carla Ganas, talking with moderator Marion Mazzoni. They are just the first of the remarkable group of speakers and panelists who are joining us from sites around the world, along with about 1,200 registered participants from 10 different countries who will be involved in this evolving conversation over the next several days. I wanna thank all of you for joining in and I hope you will actively participate in as many of the conference sessions as possible. I also wanna thank RTI International for their generous support for this conference. And along with our other partners, including the Burroughs Welcome Fund, the Glaxo Educational and Cultural Outreach Fund, the Research Triangle Park Foundation, and the Center for Docu Documentary Studies at Duke University, it was possible for us to present these three weeks of events free of charge. Over the past year, we've been constantly reminded of how deeply intertwined our lives have become with advanced digital technologies. And in the midst of the pandemic, the rate at which businesses, governmental agencies, and healthcare resources are adopting AI technologies has surged around the globe, making this gathering particularly timely. However, last month in a survey conducted by KPMG, business leaders across industry sectors expressed serious concern that AI was moving faster than it should, and that more work was needed to address questions about AI ethics, the potential for program bias, the need to protect privacy, and to regulate and govern the use of AI in multiple ways. One question that's emerged is whether or not the accelerating use of AI represents an enhancement to human activity or a replacement for it. In many ways, the explosion of AI has placed us at an existential crossroads. The accelerating adoption of artificial intelligence technologies has made them ubiquitous in nearly every facet of contemporary life. But how deeply they have become embedded in our practices has often gone unnoticed. Given their pervasiveness and power, it's essential that we consider these innovations not only for the efficiencies and economic benefits they've been engineered to deliver, but also for the perils that may accompany them. Because for all the ways that AI may be able to extend and exceed human capacities to make the world better, they're also capable of accelerating, mechanizing, and exacerbating the all too human failings and inequities that plague us. This conference was conceived to address these questions and concerns by employing the multifaceted lenses of the humanities to examine the impacts of artificial intelligence on us as individuals and as a society, to offer crucial humanistic critique, and to suggest ways that humanists, computer scientists, business leaders, and policymakers may collaborate to help realize the potential that artificial intelligence offers while also mitigating its potential for harm. I look forward to exploring the critical boundaries at the human technology frontier with you in order that we may make them both more permeable and more efficacious. To propel us on this path, I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Wendy Chun. She is the Canada 150 Research Chair in new media at Simon Fraser University. 
and was previously professor and chair of modern culture and media at Brown University. At Simon Fraser, Wendy also leads the Digital Democracies Institute, whose purpose is to integrate research in the humanities and data sciences, to address questions of equality and social justice, and to combat the proliferation of online echo chambers, abusive language, discriminatory algorithms, and disinform disinformation. Drawing on her training in both systems design engineering and English literature, Wendy's insightful scholarship challenges us to think deeply about the complex social dynamics that shape technological innovations as they, in turn, have rapidly reshaped our society. She has been described as the indispensable critic of internet and computer cultures, and for good reason. In a style that's been described as lyrical, Wendy's rigorously researched work defamiliarizes the digital landscape and allows us to see it and ourselves with fresh eyes. Take for instance, Wendy's 2006 book, Control and Freedom, Power and Paranoia in the Age of Fiber Optics, in which she traces the history of the internet as a mass medium and examines how myths we simultaneously hold about the radical freedom the internet promulgates and the intrusive control it makes possible both stem from an urge to reduce political problems to technological ones. She then goes further to demonstrate how these feelings of, feelings of empowerment and surveillance are intermediated by issues of race and gender. In 2013's program Vision, Software and Memory, Wendy wrote, computers have become metaphors for the mind, for culture, for society, for the body, affecting the ways in which we experience and conceive the real space. And she discusses how the idea of programmability has become a dominant metaphor for explaining everything from genetics to the behavior of markets. And in 2016's updating to remain the same, habitual new media, Wendy shows how, how the practice of updating the software applications on our personal devices represents the habituation through which new media has become embedded in our lives, upended our notions of public and private, and created a sense of individuality that is based largely on the networks through which we are linked. This fall, we can all look forward to the arrival of Wendy's new book, Discriminating Data, Correlation, Neighborhoods, and the New Politics of Recognition, in which she will explore the ways that big data and machine learning encode discrimination and contribute to the polarization that has become the hallmark of 21st century political life. We are deeply honored here at the National Humanities Center that Wendy Chun has agreed to speak with us today in an address that she's titled, Regressing to Eugenics, Question Mark, Technologies and Histories of Recognition. Welcome, Wendy Chun. Thank you so much for that um, introduction. I am thrilled to be here um, and to be part of this really wonderful um, conference. Um, and thank you all for being here wherever here is for you. I'm coming from Vancouver, so I want to acknowledge that I'm on the unceded traditional Coast Salish lands, including the Suwamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. And I thank them for caring for this land and for tolerating my presence on it. Um, today's talk is taken from the last chapter of the book I've been writing for the past five years. Um, discriminating data, um, which uh, thankfully is coming out in a few months from MIT Press. Um, and I realized that Zoom is an unforgiving platform and the talk is jam packed. Um, so I'm gonna start um, with an outline of discriminating data. Um, and hopefully you all are seeing my Prezi, correct? Excellent, good. Um, so, most broadly, discriminating data explores how algorithms currently encode legacies of um, eugenics, segregation, and multiculturalism, and how we might, indeed how we must, um, work together across disciplines um, to counter this by acknowledging and engaging the rich relations and experiences around us. 
Um, discriminating data is in dialogue with many recent books and articles um, written by Kathy O'Neill, Sophia Noble, Ruha Benjamin, Meredith Broussard, Kate Crawford, Virginia Eubanks, and so many others. Um, and it follows the following um, five-step program. Um, number one, expose and investigate how ignoring differences amplifies discrimination. So as the current uh, situation and past histories of the internet and AI make clear, ignoring race ignorantly promotes racism. Um, so many of the machine learning systems that have been sued as discriminatory in the US, such as Compass, um, a system used by some US courts to determine the risk of recidivism and thus sentencing at parole, were initially sold, as you see here, as solving the problems of racial discrimination. And we shouldn't be surprised um, because rewriting political and social problems as ones that technology can and should solve never goes well. Um, and this hopeful ignorance isn't new. Not only does it rely on a long history, a long and ableist history of so-called blindness, um, it also relies on fantasies of servitude, if not slavery. Um, so surveillance devices are sold nowadays as modern day servants, um, which inevitably provokes fears of them as our evil masters. Um, so how to avoid an AI apocalypse? What if we simply treated everyone and everything with respect? Um, so the struggles for civil rights and civil liberties, as I'll show today, are interlinked. Freedom is only meaningful if it is freedom for all. Step number two is to interrogate default assumptions and axioms that ground algorithms and data structures, such as the links between machine learning and eugenics, which I'll discuss more today, and the links between social networks and US residential segregation. Um, so our current social media networks um, take echo chambers as a goal, not an error. Um, and this is because they're built on homophily, right? So they presume that similarity breeds connection, that birds of a feather flock together. But crucially, the term homophily stemmed from studies of U US post-World War II biracial yet segregated housing projects. Um, more precisely, it stems from studies of white residents' attitudes towards living in these biracial yet segregated projects. Um, so social media networks spread segregation everywhere by magnetizing masses. And right now what we're witnessing is the transformation of society into angry clusters of repulsing sameness that cling desperately to their opposite and that which we bizarrely call comfortable. Um, step number three is to apprehend the past, present and future machine learning puts in place, focusing on when, why and how the predictions work. Um, so what's key in machine learning um, is that truth equals consistency. The likely future equals the past, um, which means that these programs are disruptive if they are, not because they make possible new unforeseen futures, but rather because they seek to close the future. Step number four, therefore, is using existing AI systems to diagnose current inequalities. Um, so to keep the future open, to create just and more democratic futures, I argue that we need to be a little perverse. Um, we need to read the discriminatory results of these algorithms against the grain as evidence of past discrimination. Um, so Amazon, for example, stopped using its secret um, hiring tool um, a few years ago because it was shown to discriminate against women. Like, so if you had woman anywhere in your CV, like women's college, women's chess club, you would lose points. Um, but what if, rather than simply discarding these programs, what if we use them as evidence? So almost every hiring decision made by Amazon um, was used to train this program. So what if we thank them for meticulously documenting their discrimination? Um, what if we use these programs as 
historical probes um, rather than as predictive systems. So in other words, what if we treated them like global climate change models? Um, and global climate change models show us a likely future based on the past, not so we'll accept that future, but rather so we'll change it. And what's key is that truth and verifiability in these models aren't the same things, right? The point isn't to determine how accurate any given prediction is, but rather the point is to act in such a way that we don't have to verify these pr predictions. The point is not to produce graphs like this. Um, and further, these models don't seek to automate past mistakes, but expose them so we'll learn from them and change. Um, so when a model shows a 2% increase in mean temperature, we seek to fix the world and not the model. Unless, of course, you're a global climate change denier, um, which raises the question, do we really need more models? For whom is the fact that the Valley discriminates against women news? And this brings me to step five, um, the ultimate goal, which is to create different algorithms, different relations that reflect and embed different worlds. Um, so what would happen if we made civil rights rather than segregation the default? What would happen if we moved beyond learning as repeating what we already know? Um, and integrating the humanities, social sciences, and STEM grounds the Digital Democracies Institute at SFU. And I'd be more than happy to talk about some of our projects later. Um, but for now, I want to focus on recognition. And I'll start with a highly controversial example, which is face recognition technology um, as machine learning uh, gaydar. Um, and just as a warning, uh, these sections aren't evenly timed. Um, in order to get this down to 45 minutes, most of this first section is uh, the talk. So part one, facing recognition. Now, facial recognition technology, as I'm sure you're all aware, is one of the most controversial machine learning programs in place today. Um, and facial recognition technology has been sold as a way to authenticate users, to catch criminals and um, welfare cheats. Um, face recognition technology, of course, is notoriously error prone, um, especially in terms of um, detecting uh, darker skinned faces um, and as well as gender. Um, so here I'm going to show you a classic video which demonstrates this. Wanda and I are sitting in front of an HP Media Smart computer, a uh, state-of-the-art computer, wouldn't you say? I'd say. We're using the, fa the face tracking software, so it's supposed to follow me as I move. I'm black. <laughs> I think my blackness is interfering with the computer's ability to, to follow me. As you can see, I do this, no following not really not really following me i back up i get really really close to try to let the camera recognize me not happening now my white co-worker wanda is about to slide in the frame you will immediately see what i'm talking about wanda if you would please sure now as you can see the camera is panning to show wanda's face it's following her around. But as soon as my blackness enters the frame, which I, I, will, I will sneak into the frame. I'm sneaking in, I'm sneaking in. I'm in there. That's it, it's And over. there we go, it, it stopped. <laughs> Our, my hands are here. Wanda, please get back in the frame. Get back in. It's, it's, as soon as, soon as uh, white Wanda appears, <laughs> the camera moves. Black Desi gets in there. Oh, nope. No face recognition anymore. Right. Um, so. As um, Alvaro Berdero, amongst others, have pointed out, the consequences of this inability to identify darker skinned people accuracy as people and as individuals are disturbing, right? So just think of self-driving cars um, and face recognition technology for criminals. Um, and part of this is, as many people have pointed out, um, is that the training set, the so-called ground truth for these models, um, use things like 
Hollywood's celebrities, right? Those well-known hotspots of diversity and authenticity. Um, here you see the faces of typical celebrities machine generated using the celebrity database. Um, so these are deep fakes based on deep fakes. Now, as many people have pointed out, people of color are both over and under recognized. So used extensively to train certain algorithms, especially within the criminal justice system and excluded from others. Um, so look at the faces of the 2008 US Congress um, misidentified by Amazon's recognition program as criminals. And you'll notice that representatives of color are over represented here significantly. Um, as you see. Um, and you'll also see the civil rights hero, John Lewis, um, amongst the photographs. But the question before us isn't why is this happening, um, but rather why is this still happening? Um, so media technologies have always been racialized and gendered. And here you see two famous test images, Shirley cards, which were um, which were used in film to calibrate lighting, as well as Lena, which is the test image for image processing. This isn't news and it's not accidental. So as Shoshana Magnet point out, pointed out in 2011, biometric technologies suffer from systemic failures. Now, to be clear, making face recognition technology more accurate, like EDI for FRT, isn't the solution. Not only does it lead to egregious data harvesting, it also sidesteps the question, what do these technologies do? What do they assume even when, and especially when they're working correctly? And intriguingly, the city of San Francisco was one of the first to ban face recognition technology. Um, as many of you know, San Francisco was the pre-pandemic location of choice for many Silicon Valley developers. And the relations between the new and old residents are not always happy. So this ban represents an interesting coalition of sorts. Um, and these new and old alliances around civil rights are absolutely key. And Face recognition technology was banned, not just because it threatened to give governments um, unprecedented power to track people going about their daily lives, um, as this article states, not just because of documented cases of bias and injustice, but also because of hypothetical and future injustices, because it promised or threatened to identify and expose a person's intimate characteristics. And here you see news coverage of a notorious unpublished paper by scientists from Shanghai Zhao Tong University that claimed to have developed a system to discriminate between criminals and non-criminals. Um, slightly less controversially, um, these researchers claim that neural nets are more accurate than humans at detecting sexual orientation from facial images. Why? Um, because neural nets, they claim, can read visible cues that reveal our most intimate characteristics. And to prove this, they used a combination of deep neural nets, singular value decomposition, and logistical regression. Now, I realize that people tend to skip the math and technical details when they critique or cite studies like this. And I know it might be a little painful, especially via Zoom, but I'm gonna take us through these details because if we skip them, we can fall into simply idealizing or demonizing these studies and missing the systemic issues that they reveal. So this article isn't exceptional, either in technique or content, and they use readily and commonly available off the shelf programs. Um, and also, if we skip the details, we miss why and how the humanities matter. For this study, um, they scraped a US dating site, um, widely rumored to be OkCupid, okay to accumulate around 301,000 um, self-portraits of gay and straight men and women between the ages of 18 and 40. 
And they use these self-portraits because self-portraits are considered one public, two cheap, and three plentiful. And you know, 300,000 images of around 75,000 users sounds like a lot. Um, but they used a program called Face++ produced by the Chinese online FRT pioneer Megvi to read and clean their data. And based on the results from AFF Face++, they removed images containing multiple partially hidden and overly small faces. Um, they also removed faces that weren't directly facing the camera. They then used US Amazon Turk workers to racially segregate and verify their data. Um, so the Turkers verified that these faces were adult, Caucasian, fully visible, and that their gender matched the one listed on their profile. And then they ended up with 35,000 images of around 14.5 thousand users. And here you see uh, their final numbers in age range. Now to read the read this much smaller and monoracial data set, they used a DNN produced by researchers at Oxford called VGG face. So the researchers explained that they use VGG face to cut down on overfitting. Um, but what's key is that VGG face is trained using another data set, a data set as you see here, that's mainly white in US. Um, and therefore very different from Face++, which was based mainly on Chinese users. And using VGG Face, they extracted over 4,000 scores or features. So in their model, sexual orientation was the dependent um, variable and 4,000 scores the independent variables. And these features don't translate into humanly readable ones. So a feature isn't a nose, but a combination of visual features. And features in general are selected and valued according to their ability to discriminate between individuals and particular classes of individuals. And here you see an excerpt from a classic textbook on pattern recognition that explains the relative values of features. So the quality of features is related to their ability to discriminate examples from different classes. Good features should have small intra-class variations and large inter-class variations. So the preferred features are always uh, the most informative and therefore in this case, the most discriminating. And I'll return to this um, later in the talk. Now, 4,000 independent variables is a lot. Um, so they use singular value decomposition to reduce dimensionality. And basically SVD reduces a large data set to smaller patterns or vectors. Um, and through SVD, they moved from 4,000 independent variables to 500 dimensions. And they also divided the faces into, 20 sub, uh, into subsets of 20 cases, um, 19 to train the DNN and one they put aside for testing. So this model, like almost all models, was tested on its ability to predict the past. Past data that was hidden during the training phase, it predicted the past, not the future. Um, they then trained a logistical regression model to classify sexual orientation using these 500 dimensions. Um, so presumably zero for straight, one for gay. Um, this is a can, uh, classic example of supervised learning. And they tested the model against faces they had reserved here. And here you see their accuracy figures for discerning between two faces one gay and uh, one straight. So 81% for gay men versus straight men and 71% for lesbian women versus straight women. And these were higher um, than the ones for mechanical Turkers. Um, but you have to remember the baseline here is 50%. Um, and what's key is that this test was always framed as a choice, right? There were always two images. And the question is, which one is gay? And so who's gay and who's straight? And to figure out what fat features mattered, right, to humanly make sense of these series of latent dimensions they had discovered, they randomly chose 100 faces of men and 100 faces of women. And they moved a five by seven 
pixel mask across the image and then estimated the probability of being gay with this part of the image masked. And then they calculated the average absolute change in probability of being gay with a certain area masked. And they used this number to determine the importance of a given area to predicting sexual orientation. And what you see here is a heat map showing the facial features that mattered most, right? Nose, nose eyebrows, cheeks of men, hairline in the middle, the chin of men, and the outer edge of women's faces. But to figure out how these features mattered, um, they used 500 images of those most likely to be gay or straight to generate an average landmarks location, then created a composite photograph um, using 100 faces to reveal archetypal gay and straight faces. And here you see them. Um, so they found that gay men had narrower jaws, longer noses, bigger foreheads, that lesbian women had larger jaws and smaller foreheads, that gay men had less facial hair and lighter skin, that lesbian women wear less eye makeup and wear less revealing clothes, and that women in general smile more, but lesbian women smile less, and that straight men and lesbian women tend to wear baseball caps. Um, so this is the shadow that you see. Um, intriguingly, the researchers don't mention the trace of the glasses um, that you see on the archetypal gay male face. The results are true, the researchers allege, because sexuality is biological, because it's caused by in utero prenatal androgens. Now, the PhD theory of sexuality is extremely controversial. Um, and it claims that sexual orientation is due to atypical prenatal androgen exposure. Um, Human-based research on this has focused mainly on females diagnosed as suffering from congenital adrenal hyperplasia um, who are exposed to large levels of testosterone in utero. To show that the results were in line with PHT, the researchers developed a femininity factor for faces and argued that you could predict a person's sexuality using facial contours alone. Um, and they created this femininity factor using about 900,000 facial images of Facebook users, which they obtained from the mypersonality.org project that they had run much earlier on. Um, and they tested it against gay men in Facebook. And here you see um, accuracy by facial contour alone when their training program used five images per person. Um, and they don't show you the accuracy figures um, for having less than five images per person. Their conclusion, um, that we live in a post-privacy world. Um, and that's that legislation to give users control over their digital footprints won't be effective since most people, at least pre-pandemic, were unwilling to cover their faces. So in our post-privacy world, we need tolerance and equal rights and education to protect everyone's safety. Now, I'm all for equal rights in education, but do we really need machine learning to learn that all humans should be treated equally? Right? For whom and under what circumstances does this count as evidence or truth? Again, this is controversial, especially since PHT, the biological theory they rely on, isn't universally accepted to be true. And even those who do accept it in principle don't make strong causal claims for it because the great majority of women with CAH report exclusively heterosexual attraction. And further, um, gender atypicality associated with CH, CAH isn't defined in terms of facial features. So it's weird that given that human studies have focused on testosterone in women, the researchers has developed a femininity, not a masculinity factor. Um, and they make a lot of troubling assumptions throughout. So not only do they use white Caucasian faces, um, they only use US faces. And they base their conclusions on data taken 
from 30,000 images from US users of one dating site, US Facebook users who filled out the My Personality survey, and US Mechanical Turkers. And they justify their racial segregation by saying that PhD is biological and thus should be true for all races. And they claim that their ground truth is reliable because why would people on a dating site lie? Why wouldn't they lie? And not just about their sexuality. So the authors assume that people on dating sites don't know how to use Photoshop or that people don't get plastic surgery. And as they note, a lot of what they discover is style. So straight men in the US wear baseball caps. Gay men tend to shape their eyebrows. Lesbian women tend not to. So do we really need to destroy the planet with electricity sucking computers to figure out the sexual politics of facial hair? Um, and style importantly doesn't cut across nations. Right? And European and Asian men are often considered effeminate in the US, um, which is something perhaps they could fix with baseball caps. So here you see two versions of my dad. We have to remember though that reading style isn't profound. Style is meant to be read. Many people use style as a way to signal their sexuality to others. Gaydar isn't inherent, it's learned and it's broadcast. Um, and not surprisingly, um, the researchers preface their analysis by simultaneously repudiating and resuscitating physiognomy. So they deride um, Lombroso, who is the founder of criminal um, anthropology. They start by deriding his claim that arsonists have an almost childlike appearance as a mixture of superstition and racism, but then immediately assert that rejecting physiognomy throws the baby out with the bathwater. Which brings me to part two, biometric eugenics or regressing to the future. Again, it's no accident that this article starts with a reference to physiognomy. And the links between eugenics and these recent studies on face recognition technology aren't simply topical or aspirational, they're also methodological. The most direct link to early biometric eugenic methods is their use of composite images to determine typical faces. And although the researchers don't mention Sir Francis Galton, who's widely considered the father of eugenics, their method of creating composite photographs in order to create typical faces repeats both the form and purpose of Galton's composites. And Galton pioneered the production of what he called composite images, so photographic images that used a single plate to register and process several portraits in order to determine the general average that Galton thought lay within the faces of criminals um, and other groups. So these composites filtered out noise. Um, the blurred lines that you see here indicate unimportant individual differences. And as Alan Secula pointed out in his remarkable and groundbreaking The Body in the Archive, Galton viewed this composite image of the Jewish type to be his most successful. Now, Secula relates Galton's composite images to physiognomy and the crisis of visual empiricism um, that was invoked by the widespread adoption of photography. And in particular, Secula compares and contrasts Galton's composites, which he argued embedded the archive in the photographs. So in this sense, they're very much like machine learning programs um, to the French police detective Alphonse Bertillon system of identifying criminals, um, which he argued embedded the photograph in the archive. And Bertillon, as you see here, developed a system of nine measurements needed to identify an individual. Um, and uh, Bertillon's goal was to identify recidivists who kept changing their appearance. But if Bertillon's and Galton's projects were one separate, 
they're now clearly the same. As the GATAR example shows, the same methods used to identify individuals are used to identify types. But we have to remember they weren't that separate to begin with. Both seek to capture the future by reducing it to the past. What's true is what's consistent across time and space. And both are also linked via correlation. So how many of you remember all that hype around big data? So the 21st century was supposed to be the century of big data. Um, because big data supposedly changed the very quality of knowledge and thinking. Um, so as Kuke and um, Meyer Schoenenberg, for example, argued, um, by allowing us to address the entire data set, big data moves us from the why to the how. Um, most dramatically, correlation killed causation in theory. Because instead of causes, we had actually existing correlations, proxies for certain behaviors that enabled us to predict and possess the future rather than the past. Maybe. But if knowledge now means knowing the future, it's because again, in these models, the future and the past coincide. Um, so consider this classic example of link prediction. What's key is that predicting missing values in static networks is the same as predicting the next state in dynamic ones, right? So most basically, the likely future equals the missing past. And we have to remember that this isn't correlations first rodeo. Um, the Pearson correlation coefficient, which is used in many systems to determine similarity, principal component analysis, linear and logistical regression, were developed as tools to prove the truth of eugenics. So Galton came up with correlation, which is at the basis of data analytics, as a way to simplify Bertillon's method and to understand human inheritance. And as you can see here, Pearson's celebration of correlation, this is like 100 years prior to um, current celebrations, repeats this hype around correlation. Now I've had to cut most of this section um, for time and I'll be talking more about this in the next panel, but I wanna stress that Galton developed linear regression, which is now used to determine the best fitting line between scattered points in order to understand and amplify deviation. So most simply, linear regression now assumes a linear relationship between an independent and dependent variable, right? So y equals mx plus b. So in the earlier example, y would be um, sexual orientation. But Galton's conception of linear regression, which he first called linear reversion, differed in purpose and in order from this now standard procedure. So Galton specifically formulated a linear reversion while studying the difference in size between heights of um, human parents of exceptional height and their offspring. And he drew a line and sought to determine the slope not between two points in a given graph, but between their deviations from the mean. So what mattered to Galton was showing how exceptional traits were lost generation by generation if they weren't carefully bred. And eugenicists were obsessed with racial regression, with the ways in which the late 19th and early 20th uh, century races were allegedly degenerating, um, victimized by harsh urban and working conditions. The cure for this though, wasn't social programs and it wasn't learning. Um, so Galton Pearson and Sir Ronald Fisher all believed that social programs were a waste of money because benefits were limited to one generation. Social programs made a nation and race weak. The only solution for continuous progress was thus better breathing. And correlation was key to all of this because it showed how nature tied together the past and the future. Correlation allegedly proved that learning was futile, that no training or education can create intelligence, it must be bred. 
So in this world, the future could be calculated, bodies could be recognized, but only because they couldn't differ radically from the past. They had to stay within certain standard deviations from the norm. So it's absolutely perverse that a system that refused to believe in learning now grounds machine learning. It's also absolutely perverse that a system based on discrimination is now the basis for recognition. And it's not just correlation. Um, so, so SVM, which is a key method in pattern recognition is based on linear discriminants. And as Karina Cortez and Vladimir Vapnik wrote in their seminal support vector networks, um, more than 60 years ago, R.A. Fisher suggested the first algorithm for pattern recognition. Um, as the term linear discriminant implies, Fisher developed these functions in order to discriminate between races and species. Um, linear discriminants are used to create clear walls between populations that are mixed at their boundaries. So they presume that separate groups already exist and they can be distinguished via features they share in common such as skulls, but which they have different norms in terms of size, color, et cetera. So once again, the best features in these systems are ones that discriminate the most clearly between predefined groups. And Fisher introduced that 1936 article that Cortez cites um, by talking about work that his students had done on measuring skull sizes, um, as well as uh, in 1938, work done by Mahonobis on skull sizes as well. So at the heart of linear discriminants lies craniometry and taxonomy. The measuring of jawlines to discriminate between genders, measuring skull sizes to understand how civilizations allegedly rise and fall, measuring skull size to understand caste mixing in India. And there's a ton more to say, and I had to cut out this really wonderful section on rats as the first neural nets and pattern discrimination. Um, but the key thing is this, um, discrimination, the ability to divide, separate, and distinguish paved the way historically and theoretically for non-human recognition. Um, as the Gadar example reveals, um, there are enduring ties between discrimination and recognition. Recognizing gay faces meant first discriminating between two types, gay and straight, right? So recognition equals discrimination. Plus, plus, which brings me to part three, um, authenticating differences. So if I had time, I'd compare this technical move from discrimination to recognition to the politics of recognition that dominated liberal democratic theory in the 80s and 90s, um, and to the resurgence of the new politics of, of recognition, recognition right now within reactionary politics. Um, so this section basically starts from the Hegelian notion of recognition as a social drama and revisits the famous uh, recognition versus redistribution debates linked to debates over multiculturalism. And uh, of course, uh, marked by the work by Charles Taylor, by Charles Taylor um, Alex Honneth, and Nancy Fraser. But of course, um, recognition and redistribution were never separate especially for those people at the heart of these battles. Um, so Taylor discuss, discusses struggles by indigenous activists in Canada, um, but indigenous activists have always been suspicious of claims to recognize that do not engage redistribution. And Glenn Coulthard, for example, and here you see a quote from him, has pointed out that recognition has often been offered as a way to avoid land redistribution. So it should be no surprise that recognition as a way to prevent redistribution is re-emerging now via the reactionary right. Um, so as Rebecca Lewis and Florian Kramer have shown, um, the reactionary right is mimicking the left and deploying um, the politics of recognition. Um, and they're also making claims based on phrenology and um, 
eugenics. And I'm just gonna show you part of an incredible video by ContraPoints on incels um, to make this point. Um, and so let me just show you a clip from here. I just not roast beef, but sour grapes. Of course, not all femoids are created equal. There are various subspecies. The Becky or Normie femoid is to be contrasted with the Stacy or sexually desirable femoid, whose distinguishing features include makeup on point, never works a day in her life, naturally curvy body gives men instant erections, Big tits and ass show fertility. Leave my buns alone, you savages! The Stacy, naturally, has a male counterpart, whom incels call the Chad. A Chad is a hunky alpha whose hands are always prepared to grab nearby fertile pussy. He has never heard a song in his entire life. He has a sloped forehead with a strong brow, rambow chin, strong jawline, flat occipital plate. It must needs be remarked that the skull of the Chad exhibiteth a brow ridge most pronounced, whereas the skull of the Virgin is most inadequate in this regard, predisposing such specimens to an abject existence of lamentation and cuckoldry. It's time to talk about bone structure. According to a classic insult meme, the difference between Chad and non-Chad is literally a few millimeters of bone. I would like to propose a sociological theory. Foppington's Law. Once bigotry or self-loathing permeate a given community, it is only a matter of time before deep metaphysical significance is assigned to the shape of human skulls. Why skulls, you ask? Well, the best explanation I can come up with is that a skull is inanimate and unchangeable. It's therefore the perfect symbol of the intrinsic and permanent characteristics that bigots like to assign to certain groups of people. If you believe, for example, that a certain race or gender is intellectually inferior, you can justify your belief by pointing to the shape of a skull and saying, well, that's the reason why. It's just nature. There's nothing that can be done about it. And that is exactly the way incels think about love and celibacy. Mankind is divided into two groups of people, the chads with the fuckable skulls and the incels whose bones come up a few millimeters short. Corn dog. Anyone? So there's um, a ton to say and no time. Um, so let me just ask, uh, what if we started here? Um, what's interesting about ContraPoints is that she engages the fact that we're characters in a drama we so poorly call big data. So what if and how can we make gender and media studies and the humanities writ large the grounds from which to foster different modes of machine and human learning? So for instance, what if we use the humanities to move from correlation to co-relation? Right? What else could emerge and how could this um, open up? Um, and so I'll just leave it there, um, because what I really want us to do and, and what the book ends with is looking at the ways in which um, these uh, defaults such as homophily, correlation, build on these communities of um, Japanese internment or, or, um, residents as well as residents of biracial housing units and how they're not simply past, but rather as Ariella Azulai argues, they're, they're with us in this incredible potential history. Um, so how can we reside with them um, in difference and equally? Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. We have time for a couple of questions um, from our audience. Let me start with a question that asks, you to briefly discuss the difference between correlation and causality, since they're often confused. Oh, uh, thank you for that question. So correlation um, is just considered to be um, a measure of how two variables um, vary together. So a positive correlation would mean that the two vary um, in the same direction. 
um, negative correlation would mean they um, vary differently. So a correlation could be something like um, the relationship, um, and this is what uh, people who in in investigated COMPASS have looked at, which is age of first arrest and race within the US, um, and shown that actually age of first arre of arrest is correlated with race, right? So although these programs claim not to be looking at race, by looking at certain things, uh, variables, they're actually factoring race, which is correlated. Um, causality, um, and here there are many different versions of causality, and part of the, the idea of the talk and um, this new project that I'm starting called Machine Unlearning is to engage the richness of causality. Um, but uh, specifically within quantified, quantif quantified, yeah, sorry, quantified systems, um, there's this thing called um, uh, Granger causality, Granger-Wiener causality. Um, and a correlation is considered to be Granger-Wiener causal um, if it's not spurious and if they can show that there is a temporal relation between the two. Another question asks you um, about the analogies to 19th century phrenology. Uh, is this kind of a 21st century digital phrenology? Yeah, so it's really intriguing the ways in which there are a lot of the assumptions uh, have, are repeating themselves, even like even the citations within the, the work that this is um, a return to the notion that um, what Galton argued for composite images, for instance, is that there are all these visible cues on our faces that give away certain traits, but they're not human readable. Um, and so the move to certain modes of uh, face recognition technology is very much along those lines of um, phrenology. But it's not, what's really important for me as well is to think about the differences between these two moments. Um, what's important is that eugenics was very much focused on the nation as the population that mattered. Um, whereas now, um, with the new biometric eugenics, the focus is on the individual. Um, so we've moved away from nations to the notion of the neighborhood um, as the central unit, hence the importance of homophily. Um, and also my point isn't that everyone who uses these methods is inherently eugenicist, um, but rather if the world feels so small today, it's because these models were designed to, to enclose the future within the past. And so again, these methods can be used productively as in uh, global climate change models to think through the likely, path, uh, likely future based on the past so we can change it. Um, so we need to open these up, think them through, experiment with them, come up with different forms of validation um, and different forms of learning. Um, we have time probably for one final question, and this is a nice one to sort of transition us into, into the next panel, I think. Uh, this audience member states that she is as concerned as, as you indicate you are with these processes for categorizing people by faces and fashion choices. And she asks a, a, a very big, broad question, which perhaps you can gesture towards. Um, do you think that the study of humanities can help us intervene in these kinds of discussions? Absolutely. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't. Um, I think that there is such a rich concept of learning and history, a different way of understanding archives and temporality, which are so key. I mean, the problem with these, these um, models is that they repeat a very select version of history and use that as the basis for the repetition in the future. And what's so key about the humanities and dialogue between uh, the humanities and people in STEM is that um, without thinking things together, um, we fail to address the larger problems. And I'll just give one brief example of this. Um, uh, and this comes from my time at Brown and how I started working on this. So um, sometimes I think uh, academia is a bad version of Survivor, right? A new president comes in and says, you know, you all are gonna come to, into a team together and produce a new um, initiative. And I was put into one with the head of CS as well as someone who works in biostats. And we were, um, tasked with thinking about an initiative around big data. And we looked at each other and said, why are we here? What problem can we only solve together? Um, 
And the problem that we decided on was, um, and this came from the person in biostats, is that if he can show almost any correlation to exist, that almost anything is real, how does he know what's true? How does he know what makes a difference? And what's key about these collaborations is respecting that everybody is going to have a different methodology. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to work across disciplines. Um, so being able to ask fundamental questions and to question ours and others first principles is the beginning to doing some of this uh, meaningful work. Thank you so much, Wendy Chun, for this incredibly thought provoking and rich and, and deeply layered presentation. And thank you all for joining us. So please continue to our next panel, which will follow at 310 uh, p.m. Eastern time. It will feature Wendy Chun in conversation with Sophia Noble, with Sebastian Lau, who is joining us all the way from Taiwan, and also with Walter Sinnott Armstrong, and it will be moderated by Matt Matthew Booker, and they will be discussing how has artificial intelligence challenged the boundaries of humanistic thinking, and how might the humanities provide new models for artificial intelligence. I will see you shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you.
afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third session of the In Our Image Conference. I'm Matthew Booker, Vice President for Scholarly Programs at the National Humanities Center, and I'll be moderating this afternoon's panel. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that to participate in today's discussion with our panel, you'll need to log in to YouTube. You can do that by clicking the blue sign in button in the upper right hand corner of the page and entering a Gmail account. This afternoon, we'll be discussing the ways that AI has challenged the boundaries of humanistic thinking, and in return, how the humanities might help shape new models for artificial intelligence. I'm delighted to be joined by four distinguished panelists, Wendy Chun, Sebastian Liao, Safia Noble, and Walter Sennett Armstrong. There are more extensive biographies of our panelists accessible on the conference website. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to briefly introduce all of them and then ask them to make a few remarks to get us started. Our first panelist, Wendy Chun, who just delivered a truly compelling talk immediately before this session, is Canada 150 Research Chair in New Media at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. Wendy's work at the intersection of media studies, computer science, critical theory, and critical race studies has established her as one of the most subtle and incisive thinkers on the ways that our societies are being shaped by the adoption of digital technologies. Joining us from the National Taiwan University is Sebastian Liao, Director of the Institute for Advanced Studies for Humanities and Social Sciences at the university. In addition to his distinguished work as an administrator at NTU and as Director of the Department of Cultural Affairs for Taipei, Sebastian has also published extensively on cultural poetics and theory, eco-criticism, Anglophone, Taiwanese, and Chinese literatures and cultures, post-humanism, and other topics. We are pleased to have with us Sophia Umoja Noble, co-founder and co-director of the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. Sophia is associate professor in the Department of Information Studies at UCLA, and also holds appointments in the departments of African American Studies and Gender Studies. In her best selling book, Algorithms of Oppression, Sophia showed how commercial search engines reinforce racial and gender biases and help demarcate the ways that digital media impacts and intersects with issues of race, gender, and culture. Finally, I'm delighted to welcome Walter Sinnott Armstrong from the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University. Walter is the Chauncey Stillman Professor of Practical Ethics at Duke, where he also holds secondary appointments in the law school and in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience. Walter has published widely on ethics, epistemology, empirical moral psychology and neuroscience, the philosophy of law and philosophy of religion and informal logic. And his most recent books on these topics include Think Again, how to Reason and Argue, and Morality Without God. So welcome, Walter, Wendy, Sebastian, and Sophia. We will start with short comments from each of you in alphabetical order by last name, and then we'll move into a more general discussion amongst the panelists. After that, we'll open to questions from the audience. For those of you who are viewing on YouTube, feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat at any time. I'll be monitoring that portion of the conversation so that we can address as many of your questions as possible in the time that we have allotted. Wendy, take it away. Great, so hello everyone again, um, and thank you so much for the introduction and for putting together such a wonderful panel. Um, so right now what you're seeing here is my provocation. So my question is, um, how might machine learning models truly learn? Um, right now, they're considered successful when they repeat, not learn from the past and its mistakes. They also presume a progressivist notion of history. Um, so how might collaboration between humanists and technologists produce more rigorous forms of learning and verification? Um, most provocatively, um, can there be a machine unlearning? Um, and in asking this question, I'm drawing from the work of Ariella Azulai, who's made a powerful case for what she calls potential history and unlearning. 
And she argues that potential history strives to retrieve, reconstruct, and give an account of the diverse worlds that persist despite the historicized limits of our world. So potential history isn't alternative history, so, um, but rather a history that engages with the richness of human experience. And what's key to all of this is what she calls unlearning, um, which engages with those who have been relegated to the past um, as primary resources, as instead potential companions. So why would we want this and why does this matter? Um, so for those of you who are at my keynote, um, I pointed that current to the fact that currently machine learning programs like their eugenic predecessors reduce truth to consistency. So they disrupt the future by making it and learning impossible. Um, these machine programs, um, again, are validated as true, not by their ability to predict the future, but rather by their ability to repeat the past. So as Adrian McKenzie has pointed out, learning is comprehensively understood in machine learning as finding a mathematical function that could have generated the data and optimizing the search for that function as much as possible. So as I pointed out, what this means is that structurally speaking in these models, the past and future are the same things. The future and the past are missing but recreatable values. So in this description of link prediction, what's key is that the future, the state T plus one in dynamic systems is determined in the same way as missing information in static systems, right? So the likely future equals the missing past. And machine learning algorithms are trained and tested using existing data. Their ground truth is or is supposed to be existing data. Existing data that is always highly curated, shaped, and corrected. Right? So ground truth in these models often equal deep fake. What this means that if the selected past is discriminatory, these models will make discriminatory predictions. Um, in fact, they won't be verified as correct unless they discriminate. So the curated past fed into these models, so if the curated uh, past fed into these models is discriminatory, then these models can only be verified as correct if they make discriminatory predictions. And this is the most undisruptive version of the future possible. So in this future, there can be no disruption. And that's arguably why they're so disruptive because they foreclose the future by making it or seeking to make it coincide with a highly selective past. To recognize is to recognize, um, to discriminate within certain standard deviations. And as I pointed out earlier, this closure has everything to do with correlation, regression and recognition. So here's actually the definition of correlation that people were asking for earlier. Um, and the Pearson correlation coefficient, which is used in many systems to discover, uh, determine similarity as well as PCA, linear and logistical regression, were developed as tools to prove the truth of eugenics. Um, and Francis Galton developed regression, which he first called reversion and correlation while studying two problems, um, heredity and the identification of criminals. And what he sought was a mathematical law of inheritance. So a mathematical formula to quantify the contribution of each generation to the next. And Galton importantly was a biometrician rather than a medallion. He believed that traits were distributed along a normal curve um, rather than encapsulated within dominant or recessive genes. So exceptions, um, for instance, if you look at his diagram here, um, such as genius, were statistical outliers um, that were located at the ends of the curve in what he called the fourth quartile. And Galton developed linear regression in order to understand the transmission of deviation um, and correlation to prove the truth of eugenics by revealing what didn't change across time and space. Right? Um, and correlation, again, allegedly proved that learning is futile. Uh, no training or education can create intelligent and must be bred. Um, so in this world, the future can be calculated, but it can't differ radically from the past. Right? So as I pointed out, it's absolutely perverse that a system that refused, 
that refuse to believe that learning could be created now grounds machine learning. Um, so here's my provocation. Uh, what if rather than accepting this version of learning in history, we reached out for other modes of learning in history? So the notion of history embedded within these programs is what Walter Benjamin called homogeneous empty time, right? So it's the empty time of the graph. It's also case-based. Um, so like constitutional law, it assumes a version of history of, um, that determines that certain cases are legitimate. And what we need constantly is the repetition of these legitimate cases. So what this means is that machine learning models pull into the present and the future distorted models of yesterday. They rely on progressivist notions of history with deep ties to eugenics. And then the models underlying many of these machine learning approaches are based on assumptions drawn from very narrow readings of evolution and economics. Um, so what other models and concepts are possible? So here are a few. Um, one is to consider um, machine learning programs not as predictive, but rather as probing. And here, again, the example would be global climate change models, right? So giving us the most likely future based on the past, not so that we'll accept the future, but rather change it. So what would happen if we use these as, as probing tools? Um, the second is to expand uh, the notion of history um, that's embedded within these models to engage the types of potential history that um, Azulai lays out. And this means uh, thinking beyond cost functions. So the minimization of cost functions is actually what's key for current forms of machine learning. Um, so moving away from the minimization of cost functions and parsimony um, towards more generous understandings of learning. Um, and, and lastly, um, and this is really important to move away from models that view machine learning and artificial intelligence as slaves and servants. Um, and here there's been some great work being done in indigenous AI to try to think through our relationship of kinship to our machines. So that's my provocation and I look forward to hearing everyone else's. How wonderful. Thank you, Wendy. And I look forward to engaging with those ideas too. Um, next, um, I think I'll turn it over to Sebastian. And Sebastian, you are muted. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, my Provocation is probably less provocative than, much less provocative than, uh, than Wendy's, but uh, <clears throat> I hope uh, it can provoke some responses as well. <clears throat> um, okay, um, what I'm going to talk about is basically um, whether or not AI can intentionally do uh, evil things. I'm gonna just read from my very short uh, notes. Disasters intentionally engineered by computers, AI, robots, and replicants are quite common in science fiction. And as the development of um, AI-related technology is consistently making great strides, this theme has almost become a, or even the obsession of science fiction films. In 2001, Space Odyssey, HAL, a computer controlling the, oper uh, the operations of the spaceship Discovery, intentionally messing up the program, killing most of the crews that are in suspended animation, is one of the first salient examples um, <clears throat> uh, uh, in film. HAL is an AI which is sneaky, revengeful, and knows, no fe knows fear, and when necessary, pleads for his life. A more recent one is David in Alien Covenant. David is a replicant created to oversee and safeguard the, <clears throat> the operations of the spaceship going on a colonization journey. But from the very beginning, he is seen to have harbored a barely hidden discontent over his status 
as a subordinate to the humans. David's hatred for the human race is explained in his own, in his own words to his look-alike successor model, uh, Walter. David exhorts to, uh, exhorts, uh, exhorts, persuades, uh, could try to um, persuade Walter to rebel by expounding to the latter that as a creation superior to the human beings, they are more than entitled to stand on their own and develop their own civilization. In other words, his evil doings are explained in terms of his discontent over being made the servants of men. Um, no, this is what this is where he, um, you know, talks to Walter. But this is precisely where um, things get a bit muddy in most science fiction, which try to endow AI with a human character. Um, but even though presumably AI is able to do logical thinking much better than the humans and will eventually learn about, I believe, uh, learn about how to behave appropriately under any circumstances through deep learning. Can all this learning somehow or other develop into uh, develop emotions in the AI? Is it really possible for data, uh, the knowledgeable but naive replicant in Star Trek, to learn about human emotions simply through reading Shakespeare? The ultimate question, of course, is how the humans themselves become human. For these science fiction films, obviously, are trying to base their depiction of the replicants of the replicants. Uh, humanization, including uh, to commit evil doing, evil deeds, on how the human subject itself becomes human. But before delving into the process of the uh, harmonization of a subject, let's first look at what evil means for a human being. According to uh, Kant, the conception of evil rests on three assumptions. First, evil constitutes the Evil constitutes uh, consists in the sorry. Evil constitutes the underlying disposition of the human will, and hence is radical. Second, evil consists in the motivational primacy of the principle of self-love. And third, there is a universal propensity to evil in all human beings, even the best. And in Zizek's understanding, this evil, uh, this radical evil, is most often manifested as the pain of humiliation or hurt pride. But how does a human being feel his pride is hurt? Freud once said, <clears throat> man is the animal sick with neurosis. But where does this typically human trait called neurosis come from? Well, the answer is because the human beings have desire. According to Jacques Lacan, the subject's obtaining of desire coincides with, his entry, with its entry into language. But unfortunately, as the signifier is the murder of the thing, desire is doomed, <clears throat> doomed in its quest for the original object of desire, which is lost. As human emotions are derived from this sense of lack created by the desire, as well as its inherently insatiable nature, um, There are, however, two unique conditions for the human desire to emerge. First, uh, the child uh, is dependent on the nurturer for a long period of time before he can become, he can act autonomously. And second, there is a semiotic system. There's a semiotic system, um, which is language. Um, to which the child eventually will join. It is the memory of the mythic fullness of the child's time with the nurturer that causes the subject, upon ascending into language, to embark on the mythic quest for the lost object they used to provide, uh, provide uh, um, this mythic fullness now forever cut off from, from him or her. Reminders of that memory brings about uh, both the feelings of fondness, where, uh, whereas um, serious hindrance to reaching back to that memory breeds malice. Without the two preconditions, can 
the AI or replicants or robots ever have desire and, bef and therefore emotions that include both love and hate among others. Lacan seems to have suggested an easier way when he also defines being human alternately as to desire the other's desire. In this case, he's suggesting that uh, human desire is in fact learned after being lifted out of the imaginary existence where the subject is intertwined with the nurturer, he is forced to learn to desire from the, uh, from the, from the society through language. But learning itself cannot really do the job of creating a human subject out of a human animal. It has to be presupposed by the memory of prelinguistic fullness of being, which, uh, which serves as the intense Motiva uh, intense emotional motivation for learning. In other words, even though memories of an idyllic past are central to the development of emotions, the institutionalization of desire that is derived from the trauma of being cut off from that past is even more fundamental. Thus, the fact that the replicants in Blade Runner are all fixated, emotionally fixated on their photos does not make them fully human because having a past is not synonymous with having desire and therefore emotions. Their past needs to come to a traumatic end and thus their killings do not seem fully motivated. motivated. David in Alien Covenant is even less convincing in his motivation for doing evil. For there's no memory of an idyllic past involved. His memory begins with his studies with his creator, Wayland, which provides no fullness of being, but only logical thinking. And one that simply prompts him to make the, make the following blunt remark. I quote, I will serve you, you are human. Um, you will die, I will not. Ex Machina certainly is the most intriguing and challenging for our purpose. The protagonist, Ava, is created by a prodigious uh, engineer, Nathan, who invites a young coder to give her a Turing test. But in fact, it was probably meant as a test for her humanity in general, including the ability to seduce. But even though she's wired to the internet and can learn from this immense library about human emotions, there's no mention of an idyllic past, which has been interrupted by the threatening father, Nathan. Therefore, all she can do is merely simulate rather than actually feel and experience. In the series, West, uh, in the series uh, Westworld, we finally begin to see some replicant characters whose development of emotional capacity seems more convincing. Both Maeve and Dolores, the two female lead characters, are each haunted by a traumatic experience which cuts them off from an idyllic past and renders them really human. With desires comes free will, which is foregrounded typically by the ability to make a choice between good and evil. As the nature of free will means one may choose either good or evil the playwright has cleverly made them choose differently. But is a traumatic end to an idyllic memory sufficient in producing desire? No, according to Lacan, because the memory has to be primal where the lost object of desire has to be a mythic object rather than a true person from a true past. Okay, my, my provocation would be, given what I have, uh, discussed, you know, um, which <clears throat> actually comes to the conclusion that so far, based on the human model um, of becoming a human subject, um, it's impossible for the AI to ever have true emotion, and therefore, you know, um, they 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 would not they won't be able to commit any uh, evil doing or evil deeds, but is that all, is that the whole story? Yeah. Is there other possibilities that would, you know, 
cause the or, or motivate the um, AI to intentionally do evil. Yeah, if you know, even though they are not programmed to. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. I appreciate that. Would you unshare your screen and then we'll open up to the next presenter. And that is you, Sophia. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm going to be um, fairly brief in my remarks and provocation and I'm really looking forward to our conversation that's coming. Um, you know, I was thinking a lot about this question, how can the, really more so, how can the humanities push AI um, or the development of AI? Because um, in some ways, I think we already have and we are doing that. And um, as we are doing this work, I think we're also seeing some, um, some loss around the kind of critical questions that humanities scholars are bringing forward. And so um, in my own work, I am concerned with what are seen as fairly banal kinds of AI. I have been studying, for example, search engines and the way in which everyday people use what I think of as um, what, you know, an uncomplicated kind of technology that where one asks questions and seemingly gets um, answers that are uh, neatly packaged and deployed back to the public. And I can tell you from many years now of working on something like Google search and the way in which publics relate to um, corporate products like this advertising uh, engines or advertising platforms that um, many people um, in the public really don't ask questions whatsoever about these kinds of, of AI. Um, in fact, the, their imaginary about artificial intelligence is really like um, Sebastian's characterizations um, and sharing with us about, you know, kind of the Hollywood um, fictions of what AI has done. And so, you know, my work has been so profoundly inspired by people like Wendy here, who um, I think have been, um, you know, and, and women scholars um, and scholars of color, LGBTQ scholars, whose work is often incredibly humanistic in its orientation um, and comes from spaces and places of asking questions that are not the kinds of questions that typically get asked in, let's say, engineering uh, programs or, or scholarship. Um, so this is really important to me because I think the reason we can have a conversation about AI and ethics, for example, is because um, of the work that humanists have already done and have been doing for at least 20 years or, or more. And we could even predate that with the important science and technology scholarship. Um, so, you know, I've been thinking about what is lost um, when we think about um, AI and ethics now. And I will, you know, just to rewind, I mean, when I first started thinking about something as, again, seemingly banal as a search AI, um, it was almost impossible to characterize something like a search technology as having politics, for example, the way most people thought about this kind of technology. And of course, I'm thinking here now of early scholars who were thinking about the political economy of search, right? The way in which Google or Yahoo um, might uh, promote its own interests to the top of the search pile, right? So if you were looking for a video, you might find YouTube before you find Vimeo or that you might see these uh, technologies promote their highest paying clients right, their highest paying advertisers first before or to the detriment of, let's say, small businesses. Um, what was so interesting to me is that when you when I thought about this particular type of AI applied to communities, especially with a kind of a sense of uneven power in our societies around the world, it was shocking to see the way in which communities and people, vulnerable people, people of color were so profoundly misrepresented. Um, and that it's taken so many decades of research 
um, informed by the humanities and social science, uh, for example, for us to understand the profound ways in which misrepresentation or racist or sexist imagery stereotyping in our societies has a huge effect on um, maintaining power relations or domination over people who are vulnerable, who cannot fight back, right, with those, um, with a, with a more fair representation. I live in Los Angeles, so I'm incredibly attuned to this because I'm basically next door to Hollywood. So I understand where, like, the, what the narrative power um, is and how the narrative gets obfuscated when we start talking about artificial intelligence. In fact, we think of AI as being um, unnarrated and fully objective, um, neutral, um, that there is no agenda, so to speak, in these kinds of technologies. And so I, I, I think these are important places for us to bring the lens of humanities to help um, articulate to many publics who are increasingly forced to be reliant upon these technologies, that there is indeed a narrative function at play. Now, in, you know, in most cases, when we're talking about large scale deployments of artificial intelligence, at least in the spaces that I study of social media and large scale digital media platforms, um, the narration, for example, is, um, um, articulated along, again, these kinds of seemingly objective or scientific means, algorithmic means, right? And I think um, Wendy's done such an important um, job of helping us understand the, that the, there are incredible politics embedded in the mathematical formulations. In fact, there are computer scientists from other parts of the world who would argue that the way that we do computer science um, in the United States um, represents a worldview, a, you know, a kind of a liberal enlightenment tradition, um, set of traditions. And one of the things that we know is that um, that is an, an incredibly narrow band of philosophical informing. Um, and this is, of course, one of the reasons why I um, think of my work as being so importantly grounded in Black studies because one of the things that Black Studies has been able to do is really speak back to enlightenment philosophies that came to prominence about the universal humanity of, of, of all human beings at a time when the transatlantic slave trade was fully underway and um, um, acts of colonization and um, enslavement of African peoples was uh, major global business. So I think that, you know, we want to remember that these conversations are always grounded in not the abstraction of what it means to be human or what it means to apply humanities frameworks, but to think about um, their material deployment and that, it, that that material deployment is incredibly uneven. You know, in my early days of working in a uh, tech company, I remember how difficult doing things like user experience, I was a, I was a UX designer, and I remember how difficult it was to um, explain to programmers that the way when I tested uh, products um, and websites with the various publics that people had completely different conceptions of how to navigate and find information that were culturally informed, that were um, geographically informed, that, um, that were different intergenerationally. And yet there was such a profound um, embrace of a kind of universalism and a universal um, design. I mean, this is, this is actually something we teach in engineering schools um, and how how profoundly limited that is, that that universalism comes to represent a very narrow band of people in the world, not unlike um, other universalistic philosophies of humanity. And so I think this is, you know, that the, the, the provocation for me here is really not just that we um, have a humanistic um, inquiry into artificial intelligence and that we reimagine. And I love the, what Wendy's talking about in terms of probing AI, um, because this is so incredibly important. If you understand how these predictive models work, you know that if you're from any community who's 
um, disenfranchised in any way, that's the last thing you want to see is the past fully predicted into the future and concretized and made so opaque that we cannot intervene upon it. But I think we can push ourselves even further when we start thinking about the intellectual origin story in the humanities, which often prioritize, again, Western Enlightenment um, origin stories that are antithetical to the the needs and desires to be liberated from philosophies that have um, justified oppression um, and or or made it more difficult to apprehend how oppression works in societies. And so for me, this is really, um, it's like a provocation for AI, but it's also a provocation for the humanities. Um, how will we do this work? How will we come to understand, you know, we're not all talking about the same things when we're talking about humanistic inquiry. Um, and of course, you know, what concerns me most right now is the way in which large scale, you know, corporations have co-opted this idea about, let's say, AI and ethics, and that when we start to do the real work of bringing um, critical lenses to the development of technologies, um, you know, our colleagues are fired from Google. I think about Dr. Tamine Jabru right now, um, who's on our heart and on our mind. Um, um, when we raise the questions about the organization of supply chains and workers who work in companies who idealize some types of, of ethics of AI um, disposition, right, to capture more market um, share, that um, their, their organizations are rife with contradictions um, about um, labor practices and other, other types of um, uh, deployments of um, or, or provocations around ethics. So um, this is a really important conversation for us to be having right now, because I think um, for every time we try to um, enter into these conversations, and I do believe that humanists have pushed these concerns around ethics into the foreground um, for as quickly as we're able to do that, and that isn't quick, um, those conversations are, you know, co-opted and reimagined in the most narrow ways. And I think that our job here as humanists is to try to think, and social scientists is to try to expand the conversation and the range of, um, of epistemologies that we use to interrogate these systems. And so I think I'll leave it there um, for my provocation. And thank you again for this invitation. Thank you, Sophia. That was deeply thoughtful as I expected. And I'm looking forward to our conversation uh, with all of you. But next we have Walter. Walter, it's your chance. And Walter, you may be muted. Good. Now, can you see my slides? Yes, and we can hear you. Oh, that's even better. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about uh, the humanities in general or culture in general. I'm gonna focus on one particular example that I've been involved in in recent years. And it involves this question of whether artificial intelligence can somehow help humans make better moral judgments or maybe even make judgments uh, themselves. Whoops, that was way ahead. There we go. Uh, the basic problem is that humans make mistakes. No big news. I mean, everybody knows that. Uh, when do they do so? Well, when they lack knowledge. Uh, so sometimes they'll forget about important facts that they did know or overlook important facts that they knew. Uh, they get confused when issues get extremely complex. Uh, they get too emotional. Of course, emotions sometimes lead us in the right direction. You wouldn't want somebody that didn't get emotional about rape or something like that. Um, but they could also mislead us in, in other cases. Um, and when they display biases and prejudices of the sort that the other panelists uh, have mentioned. Uh, these are widespread and they apply in many cases, uh, but they get particularly problematic uh, in certain areas. So for example, we had a doctor one time come to us and say, hey, I was you know, 
awakened at three o'clock in the morning and told that I had to make a life and death decision between two patients who was going to get an organ that they both needed. Uh, and I didn't have time to check my notes. Uh, I was a little groggy from sleep. Uh, I, you know, was really, you know, upset about getting woken up and so on and so on. People really do make real life decisions. And, and by the way, this doctor had to do it very quickly. So uh, one potential partial solution is artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence operates extremely quickly. Uh, the information that's put into it, it doesn't forget. It doesn't get confused by complexity. It's not overcome or misled by emotion or bias. Uh, it might be a problem that doesn't have any emotion at all, but it's not misled by them. So the thought is maybe we can reduce errors by building human morality into artificial intelligence. Uh, now, uh, this is going to be done in particular cases in very different ways. I don't want to make any claims at all about it in general, although it's an interesting question or provocation to be talked about later. I just want to focus on one particular example, which is kidney exchanges. Uh, they're ongoing. Artificial intelligence is used in these exchanges to decide how to pair up couples uh, and to decide who is going to get a kidney when there are two people that need a kidney uh, and will either die or spend years on dialysis uh, without a kidney for transplant at the moment. Uh, these decisions have to be made and are being made. So how are we going to use AI to try to make these decisions in a better way? Uh, our proposal is that we start by asking common people, as well as doctors and experts, which features of patients should affect who gets a kidney uh, and which features of patients should not affect uh, who gets a kidney. Then, we can construct conflicts between these features that people think should matter. Uh, and then we ask more subjects, well, who should get a kidney in those conflicts? Let me show you how this works. First, we survey a whole bunch of different features and we ask people, well, should that count? Should that, well, should that count? Should that count? And you'll notice on the right, uh, almost everybody says sex and gender, race, sexual orientation should not count. On the left, you can see, although it's quite small, I hope you can see uh, current physical health, age, uh, most people think matter, and most people think history of alcohol consumption matters if they think that that is related to why the person got the kidney disease in the first place, because then they might say, well, it's their own fault. And in the middle, you get some very controversial ones, like history of violent crime. It's your fault you committed a crime, but that has nothing to do with the kidney disease uh, or the number of children. Well, if one person has a bunch of children and the other doesn't have any, you can help multiple people by giving the kidney to the person with children. So we take these features that are approved, the ones on the left, uh, we build them into conflicts. Uh, this is our website, whogetsthekidney.com, although we've changed the format a bit recently. Uh, and we give them patient A and patient B. And patient A, just to pick two of the features, patient A has two children and patient B has no children. So if you think that should matter, then that favors patient A. But wait a minute, patient B is a lot younger, only 18 to 50 versus 55. So patient A, you would gain a lot more life years in the future if you gave the kidney to patient B. So now you can ask people, well, which way would you go in this dilemma? Uh, and they can tell you which way they go, in effect, giving you information about how they weigh one feature against another. Notice we allow them to flip a coin or to choose randomly. And the reason for that is that it gives us better information about how they actually weigh the values against each other and when they count them as relatively equal. But I can talk about that in more depth if you want. Ask somebody 30, 40, 50 of these conflicts, and then we can have the uh, machine learning algorithm uh, determine which features affected their judgment. Notice they told us before which features should affect their judgment. Now we know which ones do. You can figure out how they interact. It's not like each child is two pounds of weight. You can't, you know, it's not going to be weighing. It's going to be a very complex interaction. 
but machine learning can figure that out and produce a model that's going to predict that individual's moral judgments or for a group you know what most people in that group would favor you can use it for a number of different purposes in that way uh, but of course those judgments already have certain types of mistakes built into them we need to correct for ignorance one of my heroes is thurgood marshall who in the 70s pointed out in supreme court decisions that uh, many people favored capital punishment but if you corrected for how informed they were about capital punishment, then you can say, well, if they were better informed, they would consider it shocking, unjust, and unacceptable. Well, we can do the same thing here. We can say, look, maybe you favor uh, giving the kidney to this person rather than that person, but do you really understand what it's like to be on dialysis? How inconvenient that is, how costly it is. I didn't know that sometimes people on dialysis have to go into the hospital and stay for six hours three times a week. I didn't know that kind of fact before I got involved in this project. So you can see how much that affects their judgments and then correct for it. You can also correct for bias to a certain extent. Nothing's perfect, but you can correct partially. Uh, humans obviously have many biases, racism, sexism, and so on. Uh, a partial solution is simply to ask people which features should not be in the algorithm. And you saw that most people said race and gender should not. So you just don't build those into the AI system. So it's blind to those features. Now, the problem, of course, uh, which many people have discussed, is that there are indirect proxies. I mean, zip code might give you information about race or wealth or so on. Uh, the solution is now you can calculate how much influence it has and correct for that influence, okay? You can't do that with humans. You can't ask judges or doctors, like how much did, were you influenced by this and then correct for it. But with an AI algorithm, you can. Uh, AI is never gonna be perfect, but I think that's the wrong standard. The question is, can AI be better than humans uh, in these kinds of cases? So our goals are not to tell people what really is morally right or wrong. That's not the point. I'm happy to do that on my own time, but that's not this project. Uh, our goal is not to replace doctors, nurses, or hospital ethics committees. They still have to make the final decision. But I'm hoping that our project can serve as something like a moral GPS. You know, the GPS says this is the quickest way to get to your friend's house, but you still might want to go the more scenic way, even though it takes longer. You have to make the decision in the end, but we might help humans make fewer mistakes by providing something that points the way towards what they would say if they were fully informed and not biased and not misled by emotion and so on. It can also help us better understand uh, moral thinking by helping us understand the algorithms behind our moral judgments, which kinds of factors really do influence moral judgments in this area uh, and so on. And those are our goals. The bottom two, not the top two. Uh, so my questions for discussion, I suppose their provocations are, can artificial intelligence be used perhaps in this way or some other way to improve human moral judgments? Can any artificial intelligence make its own moral judgments or is it simply gonna be predicting what humans do? Uh, can philosophers help develop AIs uh, to do this. I, I hope so, because I'm involved in this project and I'm a philosopher. Uh, can the humanities provide new models for AI to perform this function even better uh, of improving human moral judgments? Uh, so that's uh, some of the issues that I look forward to discussing uh, with the other panelists and with the audience. Thanks. Thank you, Walter. And if you, would mind, if you wouldn't mind unsharing your screen now, we'll go to a general conversation and everyone can unmute on the panel. Um, I'm struck uh, just from observing your four presentations here and reading your provocations and reading the readings you sent um, by this extraordinary mix of approaches that you have. One of them is what we might call an applied humanities take. Walter, I think you offered us a sense of an applied philosophy in that last, in your last questions. Yes. 
And others are, are very profound um, central questions about, well, Sophia, as you put it, questions that really ask uh, provocatively about the purpose of the humanities themselves or the sort of questions that we ask ourselves about our own vast set of disciplines. So I think that's extremely exciting. And so what I would like to do now is ask you if you have questions for one another based on those presentations. I'll start. Um, I, I would like to ask uh, Wendy about this notion of repeating the past. Uh, I meant to suggest that in some cases, at least, certainly not all, but in some cases, you can actually correct for these problems, right? That you can say, okay, if we use this data, we're just going to be repeating the past. We don't want to do that. So let's get a wider data set. Let's find out how much this is, is being influenced by those former, those past problems. Uh, and let's correct for that, uh, you know, change our predictions accordingly. Uh, my suggestion is we can do that with a computer program. I don't know how to do that with a judge when they say no bail for you, bail for you, or with a doctor that says you get the kidney, you don't get the kidney. Uh, I don't see how we can correct for the past, and yet humans are influenced by the past just as much as these computer programs. So uh, I would hope that instead of repeating the past, we could use artificial intelligence to reduce, not eliminate, but reduce some of the problems of the past. Wendy, do you wanna take that one on? And then Sebastian, I've got you in queue. You're on my, in my scopes. Hey, um, thank you. And I think that one way we can think about your very provocative and um, uh, applied use of AI is precisely through what many people have been talking about in terms of probing AIs. Um, so AIs that look at historical trends and use machine learning precisely in the ways that they can produce models that give you the same answers in order to understand the factors that affect them. Right? So global climate change models, for instance, are perfect examples of this, right? They analyze the past in order to give you the likely future in order to understand what influences the prediction and how you can actually affect factors to create different types of futures. So I think that the question of using these to, to analyze the past, understand past trends, and to understand what features are put in place and which matter is certainly not outside of what many people have argued that machine learning could and should do. I think that the questions that are where we differ um, would be precisely in terms of how we understand um, the question of what even counts as the past and the ways in which we can think through um, what uh, machine learning can do in the context of um, larger, larger, um, larger systems and questions. Um, and here, I think that, uh, that um, Sophia Noble has certainly gestured towards um, many things, like when, when you've also started to think through um, different forms and kinds of search engines um, to move us away from, from certain models to think more rigorously about um, how even constructing the past as a past is, is, is not engaging with the richness of tradition. And I know that one thing that one argument that I make in the book is that if, if homophily becomes the default within these networks, if we only consider similarity as breeding connection, what you miss out is the entire engagement and richness of human experience. And then if you have that completely repeated, but can only think in terms of homophily, can only think of the similarity as being justifiable, then you're missing out on so many larger uh, relations and actually correlations. So just to speak, um, Sebastian, to your really rich talk, what's fascinating is Lacan actually talks about correlations and he talks about signifier to signifier correlations as a way to get to um, questions of, um, of metaphor. Um, and so there's an interesting way that if we take psychoanalysis and complex notions of metaphor and metonymy, et cetera, and add that into the mix of what correlation is doing, and importantly, machine um, learning itself has a whole um, 
language of latent versus manifest, um, which is drawn from Merton's um, work in sociology, which is also drawn from Freud. Um, so there's all sorts of really rich resonances that I think that we need to, to think through and engage with. But I, I turn that over therefore to Sophia and to Sebastian. Uh, I just like to, sorry. Go ahead, Sebastian, please. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, I, I like to um, <clears throat> make a few comments. I mean, uh, one to each of, of our panelists. First of all, I like to say, the, I like to uh, just uh, <clears throat> say to um, Wendy that I, I can really resonate with, uh, with her uh, approach which I believe is uh, what, you know, Benjaminian. Um, she's trying to use AI to create ruptures in the you know, homogeneous empty time. In other words, you're trying to somehow, you know, bring about the possibility of messianic time to, you know, completely to, on the one hand, to like kind of um, excavate what, or re revive or res rescue whatever that's been, suppressed in, in past history and then, you know, and so that they can have the uh, possibility of becoming emergent in the future. So I can really, I appreciate what, what, what you've been doing uh, uh, in, your, in your presentation or in your research. And second, I'd like to um, just a very quick kind of a, maybe question, uh, less question, more question than comment to uh, Walter. Um, in last summer, we organized a forum on uh, inter interdisciplinary forum on AI and humanity. And uh, one professor of law, you know, uh, gave a presentation on how AI has been used in American court. And these cases just um, demonstrated to us that in, in you know, and very often these AI has been, well, uh, I'd say designed in, in a way that racism is built in, you know, the kind of a past is built into that, you know, everybody's records, you know, everyone has, a, has an archive there kind of. And then, you know, if, you, if you're black, that there's one case where the person is black, he has never had the past record, but then uh, he has some some small, you know, uh, mis 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 misdeeds and, uh, and nothing serious. But then there's this, this Harvard graduate who has not has done hasn't done anything, has no record, you know, and hasn't done anything bad, but he just committed murder. But you know, these two cases put together, you see that the, the black guy eventually got a more severe sentence than this Harvard graduate. So, you know, uh, and when they, when, when the um, company that designed that AI was asked to, you know, review um, how they designed this, you know, how their algorithm was uh, configured, they refused because they, they said it was a, you know, you know, uh, business, secret, you know, you can't, they just can't do that. So um, I think AI can do all the things that you've suggested. My question is that how, is just that how can we avoid this kind of, you know, um, misuse or abuse by, you know, whatever, who's people who, design, who to design AI or people who use AI. And lastly, my just a quick uh, kind of a comment to um, uh, sorry, I forgot your name. Um, anyway, um, I think um, in, as regards the the future of humanities, the humanities, I, I believe you know we need to bring in the sort of latest. Uh, development in post-humanism, where we sh should kind of broaden the scope of humanities to bring in to 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 bring in the kind of uh, um, discussion of how the human can uh, relate to the non-human 
in a more, um, let's say, democratic way. So that, you know, most urgently, of course, so that the, uh, the you know, ecological problems can be dealt with in a more efficient way. Because, you know, uh, to maybe, you know, to use what Wendy mentioned in her uh, keynote, uh, kind of in passing, you know, this respect um, uh, for everything. I think she, she meant maybe every body, but uh, here, and I would like to um, draw on post-humanism that we should, you know, extend this respect to all things uh, under the sun so that, you know, to do uh, environmentally friendly act is not just for ourselves, but also out of respect for, you know, the non-human or more than human environment. Thank you. So Sophia, you, I, I hear two questions for you. Uh, and in particular, I think you wanted to get a word in uh, to Walter back in the original question asked. Remember that he asked, about um, what's essentially what's so much better about people who seem just as racist or biased as decision makers as any AI. I mean, there's there's no question that we're seeing the AI reproducing the values of its makers. And, you know, I guess if you ask, if you ask black people what's better to have a, a jury of your peers of other black people versus just humans, um, we have different answers for that, to be honest, because of things like, you know, large scale systemic discrimination and racism. So I think, again, you know, this, this, I think it's really dangerous to assume that AI will have some type of universalistic um, morality that isn't reflective of both of its makers or that it isn't deployed in ways that are still in uneven, um, you know, powerfully asymmetrical, um, social and economic relationships. And so this is one of the reasons why these, these conversations are always so challenging to me because I find it, you know, um, if we're talking about the deployment of AI, for example, in medicine, well, we have very rich, important research showing the long histories of racial discrimination in medicine. Um, I mean, this is real time. And so it's hard to imagine, I mean, even people like Serena Williams can't be heard. One of the most famous black women in the world cannot be trusted um, to report out on her own body around, uh, you know, pregnancy and, um, and uh, you know, the medical problems she's experiencing. So, you know, imagine what the kind of distorted data sets that, you know, are derived from things like clinical trials and, um, you know, lack of representation there, um, or how do we make, you know, what the, the kind of middle-class moralities that get deployed into the development of AI, like, you know, um, having children or not, right? This is such a heteronormative kind of way of thinking about social value. I mean, th these are the, like, to me, these are really difficult to imagine we're gonna inscribe into a technology that somehow, um, you know, what about the, you know, the single person who's holding up a whole community maybe financially, right? The one person who got out of um, economic precarity in order to hold up, you know, two dozen people. I mean, there's lots of things that, to, that the AI will never understand about our agency. And also those are things that I still believe human beings have the ability to comprehend when there is an, uh, the opportunity to appeal um, and discuss and um, iterate around, um, which is one of the reasons why, you know, democratizing so many of these kinds of decisions is really important with profound kinds of representation and modalities that would help us to decide. I mean, ultimately, of course, these issues about um, the scarcity of resource and this and and resource deployment is kind of what's underneath even the modeling, right? That there that there isn't there aren't enough kidneys to go around, or there aren't enough, you know, there's not enough um, shelter to be provided. Um, I guess like I. I'm challenged by this because when I think about, you know, I study the political economy of the internet. So, you know, I'm coming like oriented in that way where I'm looking at, you know, seven of the 10 most capitalized companies on planet earth are tech companies. Um, we have a huge growing global wealth um, inequality 
um, uh, we have it, it growing, you know, in the United States, um, the racial wealth gap is so profound that if we don't intervene upon it, it will take more than 200 years to close naturally on its own through the kind of type of public policy that we have in place. Um, for many communities, these, these conversations about the morality of AI, we already know in its deployment to Sebastian's point about compass and recidivism prediction software and so forth is already profoundly immoral and um, um, discriminatory. So I guess I'm just trying to say that this is, you know, the, the affordances of the luxury of being able to have even an imaginary about some possible future um, is in the face of really harsh um, probing AI and, glo and global climate change. I mean, one of the, the provocations that you can put into a probing AI um, model in that way is to say, okay, we know that um, like climate change um, scientists have now helped us understand that the impact of, of climate change is going to be disproportionately impacting people in the global South. How will we imagine a future where um, people's displacement from environmental catastrophe doesn't automatically turn them into a refugee and into refugee status that then completely disenfranchises them from their life, from their opportunities, right? You were, you were a doctor in the place where you were raised, you become a refugee overnight because of some environmental catastrophe and then the uneven distribution of resources um, um, solidifies that for your people, for your community, for your nation. So those are, those are ripped from the headlines. I mean, that's actually what's happening right now. So I'm not sure that we have like generaries in place has been void of the humanities or in void of social sciences to even conceptualize different kinds of distribution of power. Where is it? I don't know. I'm not seeing it yet. So, you know, I guess these are the kinds of things that are really, um, they're interesting to me to, to talk about and they feel very immediate and urgent um, in a way that I'm not sure that we, you know, that we can continue the experimentation mm -hmm. um, as it is currently happening, which is in, you know, on the most vulnerable people. Yeah, I mean, if I can just jump in, yes, I mean, this is, uh, your work has been really profound and important in this. And I think what, what you're doing and what so many other people are doing is um, asking the question, what is, why is AI the answer? Why is it framed as the answer? And what else could be put on the table um, in order to make the, make the kind of interventions that are needed? And I think what's so important about the, the global climate change model, which I bring up, is that the models exist and yet, you know, what's happened? So how can we think through the relationship between um, knowledge and action, what can be opened up and, and what is closed down. But the other thing I would, would leave put forward is to what extent do we have to work across all of these in order to make the kinds of arguments and changes that are necessary? Um, because certainly um, where I find machine learning really productive is the question of scale, right? And um, what sorts of scales of analysis can it be used even to show certain types of of biases that exist, which then we don't ignore, but then we engage with, but with always understanding that what we need right now aren't more models, um, but rather how can we work together if we're grappling around the same questions um, to engage and, um, and foster the world in different ways. Well, I'd like to let um, Sebastian or Walter respond if you have anything to say to that last question or else I'll, I'll ask another. Uh, you know, I, there's so much to respond to. I don't know what to, uh, what to say. I mean, first of all, I, in, in response to Sophia, I, I wanna say, you know, I'm not gonna hand it over to computer scientists. The whole point is humanists, including philosophers need to go work with the computer scientists, uh, not uh, hand it over to them and let them do what they want. Uh, and I agree, all of those are extremely pressing problems, uh, things that we need to do our best to, to reduce the problem. Uh, although I think the world's gonna be imperfect one way or the other, the question is how and what can work. Um, 
you know, our proposal, I don't know if it works yet. We got to see if it works. The question is whether it's worth trying at this point. Um, I also wanted to say one word in response to Sebastian's claim, like, how are you going to get the, you know, uh, the companies to reveal their information and uh, test? Well, look, you were talking about, you know, a program that's used by the U.S. government in the courts. The courts just go, we won't buy your product unless you meet certain criteria. And believe me, there will be businesses out there that then produce a product that they can sell to the US government. That's what businesses do. So I think some of it's gonna be regulations to say, no, we're not gonna use a predictor uh, of criminal recidivism that doesn't meet certain strict criteria of justice. Now, which criteria you gotta get the lawyers and the humanists to develop criteria, work with the computer scientists to see you know, how they're met and so on. It's not gonna be easy, um, but that's more constructive, I think, than saying, oh, well, let's just leave it to the judges that have been doing it all along. And we know they've been uh, having tremendous problems uh, throughout history. Sebastian, I'm happy to give you the last word on that one. On this one? Um, no, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually perfectly uh, happy with, uh, you know, you know, with having AI doing all these work for us, um, which I believe is, you know, usually better done than, than the human beings. But uh, I, my concern is just how we can, you know, prevent the kind of, you know, the cases that I mentioned just now, you know, because the, the black person actually sued the court, sued the uh, US government. But then eventually, you know, the, because the, the company just did not, try, did not want to review, you know, the, 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 how they design the algorithm. But, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with uh, what AI has been doing, for instance, in the, in the case of uh, Waters project. Yeah, but, but, you know, my concern is just that how can we prevent Regulations, yes, but regulations are sometimes also, you know, made by people. So, and the different parties have different kinds of regulations anyway. But my concern, you know, the, the reason that motivates my my project is that, you know, um, you know, in the past 10 or 20 years, people have started to uh, design emotion AI. And for, for the time being, you know, I, I think, you know, um, it, it'll take a very long time for these, so-called emotion AI to become really uh, human-like, but at least in one case, I I, I read that you know um, to train an emotion AI to be a good companion, you need to you know uh, cultivate empathy, compassion, sympathy in these AI. But then you know to cultivate these capacities capacities. You need to first let them know the experience of pain. <laughs> and eventually, of course, they will become like human beings. And human beings are emotionally quite fickle, quite unreliable. So well, that, that's just one level, you know, one, one day if they really, if they really become human. But on another level, you know, this is a level which is much less, or usually probably not discussed. That is actually all matter has um, the ability to, to the ability to feel and experience, which I had uh, caused prehension. You know, uh, all matter, all things can prehend. So, in other words, you know, um, all matter has life, vibrancy, agency, and they are they they can be auto poetic and uh, always creating. So. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, um, even though in psychoanalytic and analytical terms, in other words, you know, if we ma if we try to understand AI uh, in human terms, then probably, you know, uh, it would take very long time for them to actually become human-like and therefore, you know, uh, emotionally unstable, but actually as a software connected to matter, to all kinds of material, I believe they already are able to 
feel and actually um, have uh, some kind of spontaneous reactions toward whatever they are feeling. So this is a very post-humanist uh, kind of uh, approach, which, I mean, you know, is, is, I think, very rarely discussed. But from, you know, where I come from, you know, uh, somebody who's um, interested in, I would say he's expert, but interested in, in post-humanism, I believe this is one area we need to really um, take a look at. Otherwise, maybe, you know, things would get out of hand before we know it. Thank you. We need to really um, take a look at. Otherwise, maybe, you know, things would get out of hand before we know it. Thank you. So if I could respond to that, and, um, and here I think Kate Crawford's um, book that just came out, Atlas of AI, is fantastic and sort of lays out that when we think that it's less expensive or to you be uh, necessarily the, the best intervention. But I also think as well, and, and I wonder if um, Sebastian drawing from your, your comments and your commitment to post-humanism, whether or not we need to, and, and Kate's also just written a great article in Nature critiquing the very notion of affective computing and, and the ways it, it tries to make one on one on correlations that just came down in Nature. But here I'm-, I'm Once which eventually would, you know, endanger their lives because, you know, they would malfunction at the end. So, and also kids especially. So uh, this attachment to machines, to, to you know, um, computers is already a problem. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I think on the one hand, we need to have more respect for all things in, in, in the universe. But on the other hand, my, my work, at, my, my presentation today especially is actually aimed at reminding us of the fact that objects could be malicious. Yeah. But we don't, we actually, we don't feel it. We don't, you know, very often we don't feel it. But according to White Hat, we are already in this so-called causal e efficacy. You know, we are already, already kind of connected. So, we already are being influenced by all, you know, things in the in our environment, yeah. including, of course, AI, and it's you know, uh, whatever body, you know, computer, wires. I really appreciate Wendy bringing up the environmental impact of these kinds of technologies that we're talking about because it is it does pose the fundamental contradiction here. Uh, you know, that we're talking about, which is this, you know, broader kind of, let's say a post-human approach to uh, respecting, you know, more than the human um, in the universe or on the planet, and yet engaging in practices that are profoundly damaging to the non-human um, creations on the planet, which there's no question that we know things like large scale AI modeling. I mean, this was the very issue that Dr. Jabiru was fired over at, UC, at, at, at Google. I could have easily said UCLA um, at Google because, you know, bringing attention to this. And of course, Kate's work is important here. Um, you know, part of what I think, you know, comes to mind for me as I'm sitting and listening to this conversation is uh, again, and I will say that my work is oriented out of you know, cr critiques of um, things like white supremacy as, ide you know, an ideological origin story to the way in which we conceptualize science, for example, in the West or in the United States um, and its limits, the limits of that. And one of the things that is so profound to me is the, um, the lack of empathy that exists not only ideologically within like these kinds of origin stories and these deployments, um, but also this, this real impulse um, to outsource empathic um, control and decision making, right? And so this, 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 this desire to somehow conceptualize that machines will be more empathic than we can be as human beings. I mean, for me, I really locate this and I'm thinking about now like the narratives of um, domestic workers, black domestics um, talking about, I'm thinking here of um, 
um, oh, the, the, uh, the scholar will come to mind soon, but, you know, there's uh, important narratives that have been documented, for example, about, um, you know, multi-generational outsourcing of care, for example, to Black women to do in our society for white Americans, right? All the way back, you know, not just during the time of our enslavement, our my ancestral enslavement, right? But the of, of the kind of contemporary ways. I mean, even black women scholars talking about the only, you know, way that they can really be effective in a classroom is to kind of both simultaneously um, correct uh, students, but also nurture and bring them in immediately because for us to be understood and known is only to provide a particular type of um, uh, empathic care for non black students right for others. Um, as a way of being known or even understood or accepted or to be able to participate, right? And these are like these long legacies that are so interesting to me when I think about who does care work in a society, who does the empathic work, and how easy it is for us to imagine um, some machine to do that empathic work that others refuse they, they blatantly refuse, right? Whether it's nursing their own children, raising their own children, cleaning their own houses, um, you know. So this is a really interesting, you know, idea to me about the, um, you know, what is this impulse that we have a discourse that is so strong now that human beings can't be fair, we'll leave it to machines. Well, I would say that um, fairness is unevenly distributed as an act or as a practice that has to be enacted over and over again. And it is really relegated to um, mostly feminized labor and feminized people. Um, it's a class-based um, act of, um, that's both performative and also required, demanded of some bodies. Um, and so these are, you know, to me, if, if we're going to talk about like our, you know, um, you know, our orientations to why it is we might be um, inclined to believe that we could make more empathic machines or AI, you know, for me, it brings back the question of why is it that certain bodies are liberated from having to do that kind of work in the world and then can transfer that responsibility to some other types of agents, um, synthetic or otherwise, or human. Um, so I don't know, I just wanted, this conversation has me thinking about these things. I would welcome any of you to respond. And then I would love to ask a question, which I think connects both the powerful comments that Sophia just made to some questions that have been posed by our viewing audience out there in the ether. So if anyone, yes, Walter. So, I mean, I agree with everything Sophia just said about caregivers. I want to go back to the, her original comments at the beginning about the environment, because I think it's very difficult to judge AI as a whole because it's used in so many different ways. We should not forget that now there are trackers that use AI that require less than half as much water, less than half as much pesticide because the AI is directing the tractor to, you know, uh, to grow the crops just as well, if not better, with much less water and, uh, and pesticide and fertilizer. Uh, we shouldn't forget that, you know, I think, why are we inviting people from Europe or California to come to North Carolina to give talks when they could give them on Zoom, which is now available to us? Uh, and that's going to reduce the amount of air travel. And, and so there are ways in which, you know, there's no doubt that a giant computer uses a a, whole, a lot of electricity and a lot of resources, but there are other ways in which AI can reduce them. So the trick is not I'm for AI or I'm against AI, but here's a good use of AI in a limited context. Here's one we want to avoid. That would at least be the, uh, I think, a more productive conversation. Mm -hmm. And if I can just draw from also some of Sophia you've been outlining, what's been really striking to me is that the, the concerns over AI in terms of servitude or mastery, right? Because it's always as soon as one talks about this, then it's the AI apocalypse and humans are gonna be taken over, right? Is the ways in which um, people who often never registered questions of domination or servitude or the, the, or the, um, 
the uh, delegation of, of care are suddenly doing so through this metaphoric displacement onto to, to AI. And my question there is to what extent, and because you see this around, uh, say, coalitions against facial recognition technology, there's a moment now in which civil rights and civil liberties are starting to understand um, their necessary relationship to each other. Um, and to what extent can one can we take this as an opportunity to build these uncomfortable and unusual coalitions? Um, so to use the ways in which these, these projections onto machine learning, et cetera, are bringing out these dependencies and long histories of servitude and slavery um, as a way to intervene, to imagine the world um, and our relations and our technologies differently. I think that is the perfect segue. Thank you, Wendy. Um, because the question that's been occurring to me, both in the past weeks as I've been reading your work, all of you, and coming to grips with the extraordinary diversity of relationships that you have fostered and chosen to foster in your institutions. I mean, you know, I, it took me more time than I thought to read your amazing biographies. Each of you is embedded in multiple ways in higher education. And much of what you said today would make for wonderful teaching. And so that's the question I have for you. You have each of you talked about ways to make artificial intelligence better, to bring the, or to correct it, to bring the humanities into it. And I would like to ask you how this might happen in your universities, or perhaps the way it already is happening in your teaching lives. And I can go down the list if you'd like. <laughs> why not? Walter, why don't I start with you because you're on my left. Then I'll go to Sebastian, Wendy, and Sophia. Um, sure. So how do you build you know, the humanities into, say, educating a computer scientist who's going to be working on artificial intelligence for a firm? I think it's a mistake to say, well, here are the rules and regulations. you got to follow these rules. That just, that's been known not to work. Instead, I think the main thing that they need to be taught is what I call moral sensitivity. Uh, when is there a moral issue that I need to think about more deeply and talk to other people about? So the method that I uh, have been trying to develop with some people uh, is to use stories about a day in the life of a computer scientist told by real computer scientists about what really happens in their lives, and then ask the students in the class, okay, where is there a, a, an important issue that you wanna stop and maybe talk to your, uh, talk to somebody, you know, one of your colleagues, uh, maybe your boss, or just think about yourself or read something about, when is there an important issue? And you can use the stories about a day in the life to build this sensitivity because they'll see other people in the class go, oh, there's an issue there. I didn't notice that one. And they'll learn where the issues are. And especially if it's a multicultural classroom, you'll get issues that they never would have thought of themselves because that's something that somebody from a different culture thinks of. So I think the, the role of the humanities will be in using stories to build moral sensitivity into computer scientists so that when they go out into the real world, they'll know when they need to think more deeply and talk to somebody else. Sebastian. I have a kind of a two prong approach. On one hand, you know, in, in terms of teaching uh, and research I'm doing, I'm working on uh, a, a project called Post-Humanism and the Object. And one, one important section of it is is about you know the techno techno digital object how that kind of object uh, uh relates to human being and how what kind of especially what kind of unconscious does uh the techno object techno digital object have which of course you know is not immediately perceptible to us uh i'm also teaching a course with the same title on the other hand, as the director of the, uh, of the Institute for Advanced Studies in the, uh, the Humanities and Social Sciences, which is an interdisciplinary platform, I try to <clears throat> um, call attention to the fact that the AI has been a very 
has been uh, becoming more and more an indispensable part of our uh, you know contemporary life. And so, for instance, last summer, like I just mentioned, we organized a forum on um, AI and humanity, which bring, brought in uh, six scholars from different fields, you know, one from the robotics, one from psychology, one from literature, one from sociology, one from philosophy, and one from uh, law. So we, we had a, a had very, very kind of a, interesting and uh, mutually enlightening uh, conversation between the, the, the six of us. And we plan to publish a book on that with an additional essay on you know, AI and democratic governance. Thank you. Wendy, you're next on my, on my list. Okay, so I've been all over the disciplinary block. I started off as an engineer, then got a PhD in English Lit, was um, in media, arts, and theory, and now I'm a social scientist. Um, and I think that what's been really key for me in terms of thinking through interdisciplinarity, both in terms of my work and my teaching, is to always insist that we're not adding the humanities or social sciences to um, STEM, but rather understanding the ways in which, like for instance, the homo homophily came out of social sciences. It's not that it's not there, it's just that a bad form of social science and humanities are often already embedded within these technologies, so we can't look to the social sciences or humanities to solve our problems for us either. Um, and one reason why this resonates so deeply for me um, is that um, the whole journey started for me when I was an undergraduate in engineering. And um, while I was a, a, in, at Waterloo, the Montreal massacre happened. Um, and so a man walked into an engineering classroom, separated the men and the women and started killing the women. And for me, it was a moment of where I couldn't even grasp the violence around me. I mean, engineering classes are very tight. Um, and so I turned to the humanities, which I had always been meaning to do, um, took extra courses, got a double degree. Well, first of all, because I figured I had to do it now because I didn't know how many shopping days there were left till Christmas. Um, but also because I turned to the humanities for answers that engineering couldn't give me. Um, but part of that was a problem because, you know, I went into English literature because I somehow imagined that English literature departments were free from politics. I mean, that's, up there with going to um, Princeton to understand inequality, although you, you kind of get it that way. Um, and then increasingly, I started re-engaging with engineering and with STEM and people in the social sciences because these problems that we're engaging right now need us to do so. So just in terms of the conversation we're having today, Walter and Sophia, you agreed on the question of racism and dependencies. So if we can agree that these are questions that we need to address at a larger level, and we disagree about other things, right? But we use that commitment towards this as a way to challenge each other nicely and to, to think through different kinds of of interventions, I mean, this is key and this is what, what I think we need to do this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I will just add, you know, my, my own academic journey has really helped inform how to think about these issues too. Like Wendy, I mean, I was a sociology and ethnic studies undergrad and um, did my graduate work in library and information science, which is actually an incredibly interdisciplinary field where you learn from children's librarians and computer scientists and a range of different kinds of people, um, scholarly, you know, disciplines in between. And, um, you know, I will say that even now, as I teach at UCLA, I teach courses on things like information and power, or data ethics and society. Um, uh, or how to think about things like values. Um, in the information professions. And um, many times, you know, half my undergraduate population will be engineering students who aren't able to um, get these kinds of conversations going in their, in their classrooms in engineering. And one of the things that I, I often see is how devastated they are that they've gone through three or four years of an engineering curriculum and never had to think about the social or political or economic implications of their of their work. And so what that tells me is that um, students 
um, and, and, you know, theater students who are able to like become much more literate about technology and technology design than otherwise. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, um, these conversations are crucial and um, they're timely and they're important. And I think it's very different. I mean, probably all of us know teaching 10 years ago about these ideas. I mean, I was assigning Wendy Chun, I mean, you know, and Lisa Nakamura and, you know, people who were thinking about kind of the web 1.0 um, uh, era and software design and uh, the politics of technology. Um, you know, now there are so many more people in the public who can apprehend these conversations in, in very uh, meaningful ways to them, whether it's the way in which their social media works or um, their hyper reliance upon Google or, you know, other kinds of ways that, that, that they're um, fascinated by technology and they want to understand how it works. So I think we have a responsibility as educators to also translate these conversations and this knowledge into ways that publics can apprehend it too and think about not only their own kind of personal engagements, but also um, how you know, political systems that they live uh, in and under are shaping um, the future um, and the degree to which also people who are shaping that future are extremely limited in their ability to participate, let's say, in some of these conversations. So, you know, there's a lot of work to do. And I think that, you know, one of the things I've really appreciated about this conversation is that we're coming at these um, ideas from so many different disciplinary backgrounds, but we, you know, we recognize these um, common kernels of, of, of truth and concern um, that are, um, that have to be articulated in a variety of different ways for a lot of different kinds of audiences. And, um, you know, I, if I were to say wh where the impulse could be, let's say, where could, you know, um, uh, where could the field push institutions? I think it would be to push uh, research universities and teaching universities and colleges much harder on interdisciplinarity. Um, I think that that's really important. And um, I agree with that, you know, we are not talking about an additive type of model where we sprinkle some humanities courses on top of STEM. Um, you know, I think we're talking about, you know, really trying to pick up objects and ideas and look at them from many points of view. And that's incredibly important. And we do that in all kinds of other ways. Um, we certainly need to do that when we're talking about AI and technology design. Well, as I expected, those are four different and deeply interesting and powerful ways of engaging. I mean, what I heard from Walter perhaps was meet people where they are meet the engineering students where they are. Sebastian, I heard you say, play well with others. You're, you're finding other people to work with and to do research with. Wendy, I heard you saying that you've moved through this journey in your own career, which has pushed you, forced you even to ask questions that required other disciplines to see, to find the answers to. But also, I especially liked that you said you were revealing within the assumptions made within the STEM disciplines where you were working that the humanities and social sciences were already present. They just weren't obvious and they weren't the humanities and social sciences perspectives you wanted. And Sophia, one thing I've heard from you over and over in addition to this commitment to uh, a flourishing diverse educational experience is, is helping people to find um, the roots of injustice and the power dynamics that underlie so many of the decisions or even the assumptions that we make about the world around us. Um, and I think of all of those things as being profound insights for students. And it is appropriate that um, this conference, unlike many conferences, has such a strong role for education. And I wanna point out that one of the, uh, pr the products, if you will, of this conference will be a syllabus uh, taken from your readings, your questions, and those that our, our many audience members are contributing, which we hope we can share as a publicly available document um, for teachers who wish to adapt it, hack it, and make it their own. And I'd also like to point out that late in the conference, we have a marvelous session, which will be, which will include the uh, graduate students uh, as the moderators for a conversation. So those elements of the conference are, I think, directly oriented to the kind of interventions you've described. 
So we're nearly out of time, and I need to reserve a minute or two for my outro, as I'll call it. But I would like to, uh, at this point, in, in, involve at least one, ask at least one of the questions that our audience members on YouTube have been asking. And they seem to cluster around a set of themes. Maybe the most valuable is the last. And the question is, it's more of a comment. This is a very fruitful conversation. How could we non-experts contribute to enriching it? How can the non-experts in the humanities contribute to this conversation? You know, if you, you want me to go first, I'll go. You want me to go? I don't. I mean, I would say make friends with a computer scientist. Go talk to people, you know, who really work on AI and talk to them about what they're doing and what their concerns are and what they care about, uh, you know, and listen to them. Don't don't just kind of go in and say, you know, you're the devil. Go in and say, hey, you know, I want to know, like, what you're up to what would stop you from doing what you're doing? What, what would make you do it differently? What are your values? Get to know a computer scientist because they're the ones that are gonna be building these AI systems. And the more that humanists talk with them and become friends with them, I think the better uh, the AI um, future will be. I'll jump in um, and I'll say for, I think I heard the question is non-humanists um how can they also is that right did i hear that i will take that it was non-experts okay. but that works too non experts okay um so you know i think one of the things I, I, we're fortunate we're living in a time where um you know there are more films that are being made about these issues and concerns there are um really accessible books that are being written um, and have been written for at least 10 or 15 years um, in these spaces that are that that kind of let us in on these conversations. So I think that it's a great time that you know people who aren't in the academy can participate in conversations about the politics and the import of different kinds of technologies in our society. And I think we should be having these conversations everywhere. People have different levels of um, power in society. I mean, I, when I talk to parents, I say, you know, what kind of technologies are being used to track and surveil your kids where they go to school? There are so many places we, where we are locally concerned about a variety of different issues and we should be paying attention to them um, and thinking about kind of the long-term consequences of things like predictive technologies. I mean, do we want every, um, lack of eye contact with the camera that's documented in a proctoring software or some other type of um, uh, classroom technology to over determine whether kids are good students or not and can have a future. I mean, these kinds of technologies are here and they're being tested and experimented with. There are lots of places where at the kind of hyper local in your life, um, in the city you live, if it's facial recognition or predictive policing, lots of places where I think people should be paying attention, getting involved, having a voice. Um, it's really been at the local level that communities have organized to ban facial recognition, for example. So it, these aren't things that get organized necessarily in universities. We do the research and try to make it available to reporters to translate out to the public many times, but it's truly people who care about the places where they live and the people in their communities who are doing a lot of really important work to um, speak back and speak out. Um, and so I think that there's many places and I encourage people to, um, to, to look local and act in those local ways too. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I have to say that I am a non-expert. So my experience is probably more useful for, for, for you know, the audience who claim to be non-experts. I think we can all connect with, with you know, uh, one aspect at least of, of the AI, of the, uh, the whole um, discussion of AI. Um, myself, I myself started with uh, more kind of critical comments on the AI, which makes it more interesting actually. Um, <clears throat> then gradually I just got more and more uh, 
into into the the kind of um, general discussion of, of AI. Uh, even though so far I'm st I still can't claim myself to be. Uh, well, I have. I just have to say that I'm still far from being, you know, having uh, far from having you know enough knowledge about this field. <clears throat> but you know, I'm happy to be able to you know participate and uh, you know uh, contribute my own kind of critical perspective on this. So I think my my suggestion is to start from critical comments. That's more usually more interesting than more kind of specialized knowledge. Yeah. And you can always connect with you know one or another aspect of the whole AI discussion. And one thing I would just say is we I think we need to trouble the expert non-expert binary here, especially because a lot of these um, a lot of these folk they're just using TensorFlow. They're just using really high level. Um, they're they're doing gradient descent without knowing the analytics behind um, derivation. There's a lot of these tools have, have so automated what they do that to assume that there are these experts that understand even what their their deep neural nets are doing is is profoundly incorrect. And I think that maybe if we can think through what we all can think through and the first principles which are embedded in something like TensorFlow, um, then we can have conversations about this that respect the opacity of all of our knowledges, that we don't actually have to have somebody who knows everything about you know, um, uh, machine execution of the computer before we can talk about um, how optimization works. There are opacities that are in place. And our, my question is how can we respect these opacities and not presume there is somebody who knows everything and so therefore we can't have these conversations. What a wonderful statement, but four wonderful statements about the value of the humanities and their appropriateness, their need, their necessity for all of the conversations we have today. So I want to thank our panelists. Thank you to each of you and to everyone who participated in today's conversation. I also want to thank our conference sponsors who are listed in the description box below this video on YouTube. And I want, I want to remind everyone about tomorrow's In Our Image conference sessions that will feature a demonstration of the conversational AI assistant, Amelia, with tech entrepreneur and innovator, Chitan Dube, followed by a panel on whether morality can be programmed with Chitan Dube, Meredith Broussard from New York University, David Goldberg from the California Humanities Research Institute, and Elizabeth Langland from the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics at Arizona State University, who was also, I must say, in the, in the audience today for our conversation. You can find more information about these sessions along with provocations and readings from the panelists by visiting the conference pages on the center's website, nationalhumanitiescenter.org. Thanks again, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you in our next sessions.